and I have been incredibly lucky in my career to have, I guess, had that chance to hold power to account. Princes, yes, prime ministers, presidents, policy makers. But here's the thing. It, it is, it's got and it is getting harder. And tonight I want to just explore that because my suspicion or no, okay, be braver, my thesis is that the political actors have changed. Politics has changed. But we, as journalists, have not yet caught up. A total disconnect between the dire warnings over energy and food bills that are massively hurting people in this country and the SW1 power vacuum circus. We followed Tory leaders on tour, assessing their views on the culture war, the price of their accessories, or a tax cut. We've heard not once, but twice from the front runner that a policy idea was misinterpreted by the media and that, my favorite, a question was asked in a left-wing way. <laughs> we then saw that same candidate caught privately apologizing to the presenter for attacking the media as if it had been an indelicate comment she'd made about his tie, rather than a staple of our democracy. And we only know that conversation because it was caught on hot mic. That conversation should have been said out loud. This isn't normal, or rather, it shouldn't be. Now, populism, make no mistake, is not a traditional ism of ideology. It's not Marxism or Reaganism. It has no adherence to a set belief or policy. The political scientist Kasmuda explains it as the idea that society is separated into two groups at odds with one another, the pure people and the corrupt elite. The editor-in-chief of foreign policy, Moises Naim, goes a step further. He says, populism is best understood as a strategy for gaining and wielding power. Frequently, it's a method of campaigning, often in the guise of the underdog. And once in power, in government, it continues to campaign, picking imaginary fights to assert its struggle, even though it is now demonstrably, undeniably, the top dog, not the underdog. So what follows here, just to be clear, is not a critique of left or right, conservatives versus right labor, Democrat versus Republican. None of this has anything to do with policy. It's why populist parties can shapeshift between the right and left, attract voters of traditional parties or none. It's not an ideology. It is a means to achieve and retain power. And I speak from experience when I say that it took us too long to recognize it for what it was and to find the journalistic tools needed to deal with it. One year after the Brexit vote, shortly after the 2017 election had left Prime Minister May without a majority and in a particularly precarious position, I remember interviewing the prominent Leave campaigner, also a former candidate for Prime Minister, Andrea Leadsom. The EU Council President had told the BBC of his concerns over Brexit relations. And when I asked Ms Leadsom what she could point to that wasn't, was going well in the negotiations, she told me, with some exasperation, it would be helpful if broadcasters were willing to be a bit patriotic. The country took a decision. Now look, you could argue that my patriotism at that moment was shown in an attempt to do the job well, interpret for our license fee paying public the state of government negotiations. But I do think that's missing the point. It's certainly missing the strategy because the way populism works on us as journalists is to somehow seek to divide us from the public, to make us feel that we are not of the people, that those in power are the only ones that can understand normal folk, and that we, the media, are somehow getting in the way of that relationship between the people and their government. I wonder if you remember Donald Trump's admission to uh, the CBS correspondent, Leslie Stahl, on the campaign trail. She would later tell an awards dinner of the moment that he admitted the real reason for his continually bashing the press. I'm quoting Ms. Stahl here. She said, he said, you know why I do it. 
I do it to discredit you all and demean you all. So when you write negative stories about me, no one will believe you. The larger the gap, in other words, that populists can create between recognizable media sources and the people, the less impeded they will be by any scrutiny, any attempt to hold them accountable for the decisions they make in power. You think that's old news? Just last week, Liz Truss told the host of the GB News Hustings, it's not the BBC here, you actually get your facts right. It was an artful bit of flattery which she used to evade a challenging question. We merely picked up the story the day after the Cummings Rose Garden press conference. And our intro stated bluntly and baldly that he'd broken the rules. And it asked why the government, Boris Johnson, was standing by him. The introduction set out, as is often the case, the rest of the show. We had Conservative MPs explaining the PM's loyalty. We had pollsters explaining the public horror on that issue. We had defenders, we had critics, and we had a detailed analysis of which rules had been broken and when. In other words, the introduction was a precy of what viewers could expect of the whole show. And on the night itself, the programme passed off with a few pleasant texts from BBC editors and frankly, little else. It was only the next morning that the wheels fell off. A phone call of complaint was made from Downing Street to the BBC News management. This, for context, is not unusual. It wasn't unusual in the Blair days, far from it, in the Brown days, in the Cameron days. What I'm saying is, it is pretty normal for government spin doctors to vocalise their displeasure with journalists. What was not foreseen was the speed with which the BBC sought to pacify the complainant. Within hours, a very public apology was made. The programme was accused of a failure of impartiality. The recording disappeared from the iPlayer and there were paparazzi outside my front door. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not standing here trying to pretend our intro was the Gettysburg Address. When I hear it now, Honestly, I think it was a bit long-winded, wordy, sounded a bit peaked, but I don't think, wow, what a shocking breach of impartiality because we called out the actions of one of the chief architects of the COVID laws. We show our impartiality when we report without fear or favor, when we're not scared to hold power to account, even when it feels uncomfortable to do so, when we understand that if we've covered rule breaking by a Scottish chief medical officer or an English government scientist, then journalistic rigor should be applied to those who make policy within number 10. The one person, ironically, who understood this was Dominic Cummings himself, who texted me that very evening to offer his wry support. So back to the speed of response. <laughs> Weird, right? Why had the BBC immediately and publicly sought to confirm the government spokesman's opinion without any kind of due process? It makes no sense for an organisation that is admirably, famously rigorous about procedure, unless it was perhaps sending a message of reassurance directly to the government itself. Put this in the context of the BBC board, where another active agent of the Conservative Party, a former Downing Street spin doctor and former advisor to BBC rival GB News now sits, acting as the arbiter of BBC impartiality. According to the Financial Times, he's attempted to block the appointment of journalists he considers damaging to government relations, provoking Labour's deputy leader, among others, to call it Tory cronyism at the heart of the BBC. We, journalists, management teams, organisations, are primed to back down, even apologise, to prove how journalistically fair we are being. And that can then be exploited by those crying, buy us, if it suits those in power to shut us up or down, they can. Critically, it is lose-lose for the audience. And there's the rub. 
Because whatever our journalism does, it must earn the trust of our listeners, our audiences, our readers. Otherwise, we are mouthpieces. We are mere clients of those in authority, cozy with those in command, disconnected from the very people that we are trying to serve. And to those of you wondering why this still feels stuck in the Brexit and the Trump days, I'll say this. We are. Those two seismic shifts have not been and gone. They've come and stayed. 18 months after an attempted coup on the Capitol, on the democratic functioning of America, the architect behind the lie that brought the rioters is considering another run for president with the backing of millions of Americans. Here in the UK, we spent early summer watching the havoc at Dover Customs meet with a wall of silence around Brexit. Those who promise to get Brexit done can't mention it because it clearly isn't. Their insistence on third nation status has meant passport checks and horrendous waiting times. Labour avoids talking about Brexit because it's decided, rightly or wrongly, to distance itself from Remainer tags. And large sections of both the BBC and government supporting newspapers appear to go into an automatic crouch position whenever the Brexit issue looms large. Many broadcasters fear discussing the obvious economic cause of major change in this country in case they get labelled pessimistic, anti-populist, or worse still, see above, unpatriotic. And yet every day that we sidestep these issues with glaring omissions feels like a conspiracy against the British people. We are pushing the public further away. Why should our viewers, our listeners, come to us to interpret and explain what's going on when they can see our own reluctance to do so? When we hear Donald Trump or Zach Goldsmith or Nadine Doris or Marjorie Taylor Greene talking about a witch hunt or Boris Johnson going the way of deep state chat, our senses should be primed. This is often a precursor to the rejection of legitimate checks and balances. We should ask why they're so afraid of scrutiny. We should beware the parallel that is not remotely parallel. The FBI search on Trump's house at Mar-a-Lago this month was reimagined by Trump for his supporters as equivalent to Richard Nixon's burglary of the Watergate office building. It wasn't. It's a trope, see false equivalents. Just as we now understand when we hear the phrase fake news, we should think of Trump's own definition for it, a conscious attempt to discredit and demean. Let's not turn ourselves inside out wondering if it's true. So the more we recognize these tropes as old, slightly sad and malign friends, the better equipped we are to call them out 